Welcome to our first episode of the Men's Locker Room here at New Faith Church. I'm Kennedy Miller. We have our Director of Pastoral Care, Reverend Eddie Murphy, our, our Pastor of the Youth, Eric McMillan Jr., and one of our committed members, Reggie Franklin. Today what we're going to discuss is we're going to talk about some of the Last Dance documentary that went on. Uh, we're going to talk about the upcoming NBA because it is, it is coming back July 31st. And we're going to talk about who some of these guys looked up to and admired when they were growing up a as basketball players. So we'll start it all the way to the far left with you, Reverend Eddie Murphy. Who was the first player or the first team that you watched that made you love the game of basketball? Well, I, I grew up in the era when they had the old ABA. Okay. And uh, uh, even though we uh, watched the, NBA, uh, the regular NBA, I liked the ABA because the ABA introduced the, the, the ball with the different color. They scored a lot more and a lot more running, and that was the typical the way our high school was set up as well. So one of my favorite players growing up that didn't, was, didn't really get a chance to play in the NBA because he at the end of center was Connie Hawkins. 
And the reason I like love Connie Hawkins, Connie Hawkins was number 42, and that was my number in high school. So, and then he had all the moves, the big hands, and all those kind of things. So I really admired the way he played, along with a lot of the guys in the NBA. Elgin Baylor was a favorite of mine, and those four, because I thought I was going to get to about 6'5", and that's, <laughs> Elgin Baylor was 6'5". So you looked at those kind of guys to try to, you know, mimic your game after. Eric? Yeah, so for me, I think I started as a young kid playing basketball, and I love playing ball, and so when I started doing that, my uncles, my dad started showing me tapes and making me look at old things, old games, and older, you know, kind of generation and eras before me, and I just started to fall in love with the Lakers, and then I started watching them, and I started watching kind of with Nick Van Exel, Sadell Threat, Eddie Jones, Cedric Sabalo. That was kind of the first time I started liking the Lakers, and then really my love, though, came from college basketball in North Carolina. I, I love North Carolina basketball, um, and so players like Ed Cota, Shaman Williams, uh, that Antoine James and Vince Carter, that started there. I became a lifelong fan of the Tar Heels and the Lakers, and it's just been that kind of way ever since. Now, Mr. Reggie, you have an interesting take on this because you played some college ball, and I remember you telling me you played against Magic Johnson at Michigan State. Yes, I did, but uh – as far as my favorite players go and, and how I got started, uh, I got started like Coach, uh, like uh, Eddie Murphy did with uh, the ABA. Uh, that was an exciting brand of basketball. Like you said, a lot more scoring than yeah. in the NBA, a lot more flamboyant. So my favorite player was Dr. J. And uh, of course, I wanted to be like Dr. J and wanted <laughs> to dunk like Dr. J and, and everything else. And then uh, I started watching college ball during the era where UCLA had their historic run. So I loved Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and he still, to me, it's amazing that nobody has tried to emulate the sky hook. Right, right. I, I was born in 97, so I, my <laughs> earliest memories, I know I'm the youngest one here, but uh, my earliest memories of basketball were those, those Shaq and Kobe Lakers. Uh, mm -hmm. As a kid, I remember that, that famous alley-oop that Kobe threw to Shaq against the, the Portland Trailblazers, and I really started uh, getting into basketball when they lost to the Pistons. I think I was seven years old. When they lost to the Pistons, ended their three-peat, Shaq ends up getting traded. And so uh, from that point in, I was locked in. I was locked into basketball. I'm not going to say I was a Lakers fan like Eric because it was a, it was a man in Cleveland that started dunking on SportsCenter every, every weekend. <laughs> and so that, that's who I really gravitated to. But I, I'm going to ask you guys this, because you guys have watched a lot of decades of basketball. What are, what are the pros and, and cons of this league now? Because like you said, back then, it was a lot tougher. It was more physical. And you, you see a lot of guys from your generation talk about, well, the league isn't what it was back, like it was back then. So tell me, what are, what are some of the good things about the league now? And, and what are some things that you wish uh, that – this generation implemented that your generation had? We'll start with you, Mr. Reggie. Well, first of all, I, I think the talent is just unbelievable. The talent that they have in the NBA now is just, it's more of it than it was uh, back in my day and time, I believe. Uh, but I, I love the way the game is played today. It's a, more of a fast-paced game. I love the 24-second clock, you know, so that they have to shoot more, you know, and uh, things like that. So, uh, I think that it's just it was a little rougher physically, but the uh, the schedule is still as grinding as it always has been. So you know I love you know the the, the skill set that a lot of these players have. You got bigger players that are taller. You know you're six ten, six eleven, seven foot taller guys are you know out shooting threes, taking you off the dribble. When most times you know beforehand kind of when I was started watching basketball the big man was you go to the post right you go down low to the post is what you did the one thing I don't like though is it's like they forgot about the mid-range game I feel like it's either I can dunk or I try to shoot all the threes but nobody wants to play that mid-range game that's why you know one of my favorite plays is Kobe I love this mid-range game I love the fact that he got the spots there that's why um, I like offensively Carmelo because right. of the way he used that triple threat and could, could hit that mid-range jumper, take you off the triple threat, get you on that short post or that elbow. And so I kind of miss that, that, that player that gets that mid-range game. And that's why I like players like C.J. McCollum mm -hmm. for Portland that, that kind of does that. And then you got DeMar DeRozan who loves that mid-range to inside game as well. 
I, I think I, I love the talent today, and that's one thing I really uh, like, that even how the game has evolved, that it's still talent. And I just that's why I hate to really compare right. times and players because it's, it was a different, but the quality of, of the athlete is, is just tremendous in there. That's the way it sh I think it should naturally evolve that way, that we have better mm -hmm. because you have whatever. But the thing I miss about when I played, I, I feel like we was taught to play the game. So you need to know how to post. You need to know the mid game. You need to know every aspect of it. And then I was fortunate enough to have a coach who you couldn't play for him if you didn't play defense. Right. Yeah. If you wanted to play on the team, make his team, you, 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 you made the team through your defense. He felt like he could teach you how to score the ball because mm -hmm. he's Tough situational. So if you didn't know how to play defense, you can play. And that's one of the things I think is lacking today in the game, uh, the defensive player. But one of the things I do like, you see the, 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 the better players, you notice, always play great defense. That just amazes me. I don't understand how the other guys don't. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. You ever notice that? Even back with, like you, uh, Michael Jordan, he was all defense. Kobe, all de you see what I'm saying? All the way back with the big O and everybody, they played defense. Yes, sir. I know Eric, James Hard. Yeah, Eric, Eric's going to say James Harden doesn't play any defense. He's not play no defense. <laughs> no. At OLA defense. Olay. Olay. The last dance documentary um, ended about two or three weeks ago, and everybody was, was tuning in on Sunday nights for those two hours to, to watch footage that they had never seen before of the Chicago Bulls in that year and, and Michael Jordan. What – impressed you guys or, or what was something in that last dance documentary that you saw that that you didn't you didn't expect I didn't know that Scottie Pippen didn't make that much money throughout the prime of his career I, I didn't know that playing for the Bulls he was only making two million a year three million a year and was I want to say the 122nd highest paid player in the NBA what what was something that really intrigued you about that uh that last dance documentary I think the, the thing that intrigued me the most was just Michael Jordan himself, uh, the drive and the determination that he had to be good. Right. And he used every little thing he could to motivate himself. You know, he even used the, an imaginary uh, situation where he, he told his teammates that a guy said, nice game, Mike, after he <laughs> had a bad game. And so uh, I love the fact that he, just, he was just so determined and was so driven to be great, to right. be good. To, to uh, put his, uh, his talent out there every single night. There was never a time that I saw Michael Jordan loaf or look like he was disinterested in the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought, for me, the documentary was just, was just great from the aspect of watching Michael Jordan be great. I think, you know, I was, um, during the second run, I was like, you know, I was born in 85, so that second run, I was like 9, 10, 11, and it's, it was like I appreciated it, I loved it because I was loving starting to learn basketball. But now watching it, understanding it, and then having played basketball, I'm like, man, I can see the work that he had to put in to be that great and to continue to do it each and every year. Like, I don't think people understand how hard it is to three-peat in the NBA and right. to do it twice and what it takes physically and mentally. And so that's what I kind of appreciated, kind of his approach to each and every game. Well, when you look at all of it, of course, Michael was the, the highlight of the film and his determination and how he encouraged and pushed others to do it. But he's, he's still in the midst of that, uh, it showed that where you could get that great diversity of, of people and then the goal is the same to, right. to accomplish. And even though, and then I like it because it gave us a great insight into the psychic of a team. Most of the time, you know, like in the NFL, they do that the training camp stuff and whatever we get a little whatever but yes, we sir. saw something probably more in depth we ever seen as far as actually you, it wasn't like preseason it was like the season and it actually happened right. you no know, rather than you know bits and pieces so I think it gave us great insight to sports and then I think it helped uh, us see what it takes really in the commitment it takes right. if you want to accomplish something you know of course you know that's good bad and ugly and everything so, you know, that's part of that's human. Right. And so you can't get away from that. But when you look at it, he showed what in, in every area of our life, you want to accomplish something, it's going to cost you. And that's yeah. commitment to, to, to making it happen. Yeah. 
you know, I always talk about when I talk to uh, young athletes uh, about, you know, playing a sport, no matter what you do, I always think you have to, to give something. And when I say give, sometimes you have to give up something, sometimes you have to give in, and then sometimes you have to give 100%. Well, Michael Jordan always gave 100%. Then when Phil uh, Jackson came along, he gave in to Phil Jackson's way mm -hmm. of coaching. You know, spread the ball around, don't shoot the ball so much. And so uh, those are the things you have to do in, in, as far as giving up something. Uh, when he first got with the Bulls, like he said, he walked into a room and the, and, the, and the whole team almost was in there doing things that they shouldn't be doing. You know, drugs, women, drinking, whatever. And he said, well, you know, I didn't mess with drugs and drinking, so I didn't, I didn't want to get involved with that, those kind of things. So he gave up. He sacrificed the party life, even in college, to be successful. And that's why I say you have to give up something and, and, uh, to be successful. And so I, I think from all of you guys' answers, the mental toughness that he had, and, and to Eric's point, to win three in a row twice, um, you look at it now, it's been almost 20 years since the team has won three in a row, since the Shaq and Kobe Lakers. It, it has been 20 years. It's an extremely tough thing to do mentally, um, it, it, not even physically, because you look at those Golden State Warriors teams, they probably could have won three in a row, but injuries, attrition, it, it, it's really tough to keep a team together because egos get involved as well uh, when, when you're winning. And so we're going to shift to the NBA is coming back July 31st. Um, I want to hear you guys' thoughts on who you think should be the favorite. Do you think that this has it's been rushed? Do you think that it should have even been a league? Should we have just waited for next year um, because of guys with injuries? Do you think they're going to get hurt? I want to hear you guys' thoughts on, on the league coming back July 31st. Well, uh, I'm more concerned about the, the COVID-19 stuff uh, than anything else uh, because, uh, because the country opened back up. Then now we have uh, some of the rioting and, and things like that, and everybody's coming together. I think that the uh, uh, virus might spread even more, so now we got to be even more careful with the guys in the league uh, coming back and not spreading to each other and their families. But I know uh, being an athlete and being a competitor, I know they, <coughs> they want to get back out there and play and compete. And so I think it's good, and I, I think the Lakers – are definitely the favorite team to win. Well, I love to hear that. <laughs> I love to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go Lake Show. Um, that's how I feel, too. I am a Lakers fan. It is, I'm happy it's coming back for a couple of reasons. Well, one is, is selfish because I love basketball, and I had, it, it, it's hurt, it hurt me not to miss the NCAA tournament. Yes. The playoffs hadn't started yet, and, you know, and then after you watch the Last Dance documentary, you're like, you don't want to stop watching basketball. So that's why I want – to see basketball back, then I think you got to have a champion. Like, I think mean, you can't play, I think, 62 games that they've played and, you know, kind of ended. I mean, they, were, they would be well within their rights with everything that's going on because this is crazy. This whole pandemic has been crazy. But I want to see a champion, and I'm glad that they've kind of put everything on the table, um, how they're going to do it. Um, I do think there's one thing I'm worried about is I've been hearing little murmurs about the coaches and some coaches because of their ages not being on the bench and not being around because they want to limit their exposure to COVID-19. So right. and I think that's something that we have to really talk about, think about, and be smart about, you know, as they go back. Yeah, I, I, I'm concerned about the, the, the virus myself, but, uh, you know, I'm a, a, a fan, so you, you, you want that, that entertainment trying to break this monotony of what we're going through. Yes. But uh, I think, you know, it's like it's some of the concern. If they address everything, that's good. But I think that, uh, you know, as the Clippers take the West, that you, you, you guys probably going to be disappointed. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but oh, wow. Anyway, they're just my yeah, They're just going to throw that in there. <laughs> just, yeah, you just, 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 just leave that right in it's there. Okay. But uh, it's okay. But then, of course, Milwaukee. I think Milwaukee right. has a chip on their ch shoulder. You know, when a star – is driven like I, I was thinking about that, you know, their store, of course, and then Michael, that whole thing. I believe he was really embarrassed last year. Mm -hmm. And now I think he really, really is determined. And sometimes when someone have that kind of age, it, it, it just promote the rest of the team. So I wouldn't be surprised if Milwaukee rise to the top. 
I think with uh, Milwaukee, I think they might still have one more year of going through a tough loss like you talked about. <clears throat> I think every champion has to go through something before they – and we saw it with the Chicago Bulls. They couldn't get past the Pistons at first. They couldn't get past the Celtics. And it took some, it took some trials and tribulations before they finally got over the hump. I think Milwaukee is still really a true second star away from really getting over that hump in the East. I look at a team like Boston. I think Boston can challenge them. I look at a team like Toronto, even though they lost Kawhi Leonard, they've still proven to have championship DNA, and and they've been really tough to beat. So we're going to shift to our last question because we are running out of time. Top five players. I know we they it's always done, and so I, I won't really put you guys on the spot if you don't if you don't want to. You can give me the top five of your era or top five you think all time. I can, I'll start off and I'll give mine for all time. <laughs> you, know, you know I'm going to say LeBron. LeBron for me is number one. Uh, I'm going to go Jordan number two, Magic, Kareem, and then I think I'm going to say, I'm going to say Kobe. And then in my era, LeBron, Kobe, Durant, Tim Duncan, Kevin Garnett. Well, it's so hard for me. It's so difficult for me because, uh, like I said, Dr. J always comes into play with me. Uh, Oscar Robertson definitely comes into play. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Then Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time, I think. Uh, LeBron James is, is fantastic, and you can't leave off Kobe Bryant right. and his competitiveness either. Got you. So I think I'm going to go kind of how Kennedy did. My, I, if I say um, – all time, I think, you know, I think Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player to ever play the game. Mm -hmm. um, I then think a lot of people don't say, I think you, you mentioned it earlier, but before we started this, you were talking uh, with Kareem. I think if you look at just purely basketball, Kareem has done it on every level, won a championship, been the best player, been the best, been the best one on the court at every level. So I think he's, he's in there. So Kareem... Um, Kobe, LeBron, and uh, Magic. But I guess in my era, I'd say, of course, Kobe, Shaq. Um, and, but before Shaq, I have Akeem. I think Akeem is the greatest center I've ever watched, that I've been able to watch day in and day out. I think Akeem Olajuwon is the greatest center that I've ever been able to, like, to watch. I didn't watch Kareem. Okay. He was retired by okay. that stage. Yes. But the one I've ever been able to watch like live has been Akeem. And I say, so Kobe, Akeem, Shaq, uh, LeBron, and... Uh, I'm going to go Tim Duncan. Okay. I kind of, when I look at it, I like to think about the decades. Right. Mm -hmm. The 60s, Bill Russell. I can't, I can't leave, overlook Bill Russell. Russell. And then when you talk about the 70s, a key, I mean, a, a, a Jabbar changed the game. In, my, in high school, I couldn't dunk in the last year because they changed the rules because of him. Yeah. Right. He cost me the chance to continue to <laughs> dunk in high school. I'm saying, you know, that era. And then you get to the, the, the eighties, you know, then the Lakers and they they started their run again and then you get to the Niners course, Michael Jordan. And then that's why I like to look at the different players and, and you can't ever overlook LeBron James and Kobe. I always like the Kobe because his versatility. Because that's the way I would try to, you know, more than one style. So when I look at that, so I, I rather look at the, the different decades in the team because the talent is there. Then there's so many that we just left. We, we can't right. put them all in there. So right. I kind of like to look at the decade team. That way I think you get a, better th a, 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 a larger group. And then you can't oh, really can't, you're still going to leave some off no matter what. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, I, I, I mean, I just love the game. And I just, I'm so glad it's still talent still coming and, and it's just going to get better and better yeah. to me as, as long as they continue to, you know, to have a game. Quick point about Kareem. <laughs> when you talk about dominance, he lost one game four years in high school at Power Memorial, goes to UCLA, doesn't play freshman year, loses one game in his college career, yep. couldn't, couldn't play the, the first year, and then won a championship in the 70s and win. then won one in 89. So almost two decades in between winning yeah. championships, being the MVP of the league, 
the man doesn't get respected enough. He doesn't get talked about enough as being one of the greatest of all time. That is all we have for you today. Uh, we thank you guys for tuning in. I thank these gentlemen for being here with me on our first episode of the Men's Locker Room. Be on the lookout for more episodes. Thank you guys for tuning in.